Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. My name is Sam. We are going to do a little bit of a different format for today's video. Um, I am going to be talking about Fearing the Black Body uh, by Sabrina Strings. If you have followed any fat uh, activist on TikTok or YouTube, or if you watch fat acceptance TikTok cringe videos, you have seen our fat activist friends, um, foes maybe is a better word, you have seen and heard them refer to this book and say that fat phobia is rooted in racism. Here's your reminder that fat phobia is rooted in racism. As always, if you haven't read this book, go do that. So I had to go ahead and get myself a copy of this book. Um, it makes my little history nerd heart happy to be able to use my background in history to dig into this book and just see what it's all about. When I started digging into the introduction, I immediately realized that this is going to take several videos because I don't think anyone wants to sit for multiple hours uh, in one go and hear about the book. So today's video is going to be about the introduction. Let's dive in. I recently posted on my Instagram and my community tab that I would be talking about this book and I got quite a lot of comments telling me that I was brave. While I understand that people on the internet uh, are under the assumption that it would be hard to review this book because of its close proximity to uh, race and race relations, there is a proper way um, to review historical documents, um, historiographies, which is exactly what this book is. So I'm really excited to um, dig in and talk about it in that way. Before I start, I want to just give a little more background um, on myself, something that I've not really talked about a lot on this channel. It's actually that I have a bachelor's degree in history. I spent four years learning how to research and read primary source documents, as well as historical theses and historiographies. I focused my studies in my four years on American slavery and genocide because I was very interested in how the human brain works, how they are defined within the confines of history, and how we teach these concepts to kids in grade school. Much of my college experience was unlearning um, myths and or whitewashed history that I learned when I was a kid because the truth is these topics are really hard to talk about with kids. History is and continues to be one of the most censored topics um, in our school systems. And I do understand that it can be because history is multifaceted and often based on nuance and interpretation of things that were happening at the time. But I do think it is one that is worthy of our time. And I'm sure you've heard the saying, those who don't study history are doomed to repeat it. And I definitely believe that. Now to introduce Dr. Sabrina Strings. She is an associate professor of sociology at the University of California at Irvine. In Fearing the Black Body, The Racial Origins of Fat Phobia, Dr. Strings argues two critical historical developments contributed to the rise of a fetish for thinness and a phobia of fatness. The rise of the transatlantic slave trade and the spread of Protestantism. The introduction is titled The Original Epidemic, and Dr. Strings cleverly attempts to let the reader know that there was a thinness epidemic in America before there was an obesity epidemic. In fact, the first two words of this book are actually starving, exclamation point. Within her second paragraph, she describes a source where doctors plural, described with horror the narrow chests and lank limbs and flabby muscles and tottering steps that meet us at every corner. The source that she is quoting here, James Wharton, is discussing the impact of city life, which is relatively new, on humans. He explains, colonial Americans had barbaric hygiene, but their agrarian existence forced healthful activity. Later adding, daily labor in the sun and fresh air neutralized a fair amount of self-abuse at the table and the tavern. 
Wharton goes on to explain that in 1830, the nation was still mostly rural, but that cities had grown markedly in the few decades before and were on the verge of a population explosion. He goes on to say that as the cities were growing, people were more restricted and more inactive, but they never altered their living habits to compensate. Now, I want to take a second to put this quote into perspective using her source material. First, the full quote reads, Pale cheeks and hollow eyes and early wrinkles, narrow chests and lank limbs, and flabby muscles and tottering steps that meet us at every corner. Strings' use of the abbreviated quote to illustrate that thinness was an epidemic doesn't hold up in the full context. Just before this quote, Wharton explains the filth and crowding, drunkenness and debauchery of the mangy slum dwellers, as well as the idle intemperance of the quality, capital Q, threatened to make debility epidemic. This quote, when you read it in context, seems to be implying that doctors were concerned that overall, America as a nation was facing a weakness epidemic, a physical weakness epidemic, brought on by both the mangy slum dwellers and the idleness and lack of restraint among the upper class, probably related to self-abuse from their wealth at both the tavern and the table, therefore negating the argument that thinness was the epidemic. She then moves on to quoting William Andrus Alcott, who she names as a distant relative of Louisa May Alcott. Alcott said, our children, females among the rest, are trained by a community to be destitute of true appetite. While it is true that Alcott believed that being tall, slender, and delicate did not prepare young women for the vicissitudes of life, he did argue that women needed to diet and work out. He lays ground rules for dieting, including relishing what one is eating so that they savor it and eat more slowly. He also says that food should be well masticated and insalivated for good digestion. So really chew that up. He also said that women should not eat too frequently, where he recommends one to two meals per day, saying they should not eat too much in quantity or snack too often. And he finally states that food should be of proper quality. Within his piece, he also writes that women are feeble for misuse of their muscles and that they require more exercise than men, noting that he knows this is contrary to popular belief at the time. Strings also uses evidence from Dr. John Harvey Kellogg, quoting his Ladies' Guide in Health and Disease, where he states, particularly in this country and especially in the cities and towns, girls, as a rule, are found to be decidedly lacking in physical development. Here again, she isn't revealing the entire context to this quote. If we actually look at the cited work by Kellogg, this is pulled from his chapter on exercise, where he is advocating for more muscular physiques for women. He vilifies the fashion of the period, stating that it deforms the female form and he argues that little girls should not be treated as fragile dolls, but rather should be allowed to exercise and play outside along with their male peers so that their bodies may develop properly. If we look at the illustrations he included within the book on the ideal female form, we can see that he is advocating for what today would be considered a leaner or straight sized body. So far, every author Strings uses to push this thin epidemic narrative is advocating for normal or straight-sized bodies that were considered plump by normal standards at the time. Each of their works includes advocating for young women to control their eating and exercising, as well as abstaining from fashion that bound and deformed their bodies. Strings asks the reader in this section if it's possible 
given the right information, would the women of time gain in flesh and by proxy in health, strength, and beauty? What Strings leaves out of this conversation is the difference between the definition of plumpness at the time versus our definitions of curvy, plump, and plus size now, which have come to often describe women who are obese or morbidly obese. By painting a picture of thinness as an epidemic while ignoring the fact that this thinness referred to was the extreme opposite of the body types of today, probably more closely associated with eating disorders like A. nervosa, she is creating a false narrative in the modern sense. She then uses this to ask one of her three research questions. She asks, if the medical establishment just over a century ago feared the meagerness of the physiques of elite white women, when and how did they come to view fatness, especially among black women, as the greater threat to public health? After diving into her cited sources, it appears that this is a question that will be difficult to answer, seeing as doctors who supposedly feared the meagerness of women's physiques were actually in fear of women being overly thin, not of being an average body size. Strings actually said in several interviews that her typical reader tend to be fat acceptance and fat liberation folks, and she has given talks um, with the NAAFA, or NAFA, which is the National Association to Advance Fat Acceptance. From here, Strings transitions from the epidemic of thinness to explain how thinness would become the marker for moral, racial, and national superiority. Here, her source is somewhat strong for her statement. She quotes a Harper's Bazaar article entitled, Are Our Women Scrawny? She accurately describes the author's sentiments that America's women are no longer scrawny, but rather more full and round stating that this is always desirable. He adds that stoutness, corpulence, and surplusage of flesh is never desired, except among African savages. While he describes foreign women as stout and destitute of all physical charm after the age of 30, mm -hmm. he focuses his critique on European women. Strings is correct that the author seems to prefer American women's bodies more to those of their European or foreign women he describes. But the author does not wish for the slenderness that previously existed in America. The quote she uses, describing fatness as menacing, is in comparison to that of the old world in Europe. In context, he seems to imply that he's worried about the wealthy women in New York because they tend to be more pampered and are more closely aligned with their European sisters. He also describes the vast accumulation of wealth and how it has been misused for wholly selfish ends. Sounds kind of similar to abusing oneself with tavern and table. You would need the funds to do that. Now at this point in the introduction, Strings is going to introduce us to her research questions and her methodology for her research. Strings' three other research questions stem from this article. What led some well-to-do Americans to believe that slenderness, especially among women, was both aesthetically preferable and a sign of national identity? How did fatness become a sign of immorality? How did fatness become linked to Africanity or blackness? Where the book will get tricky for the average reader is after the research questions, where Strings begins to break down how and why she conducted her research and analysis the way that she did. Here she tells readers that though there have been related studies, none have ever looked at the role of race and class in fat phobia. She is seeking to address a gap in scholastic research by creating a complete historiography that connects the development of pro-thin, anti-fat biases to explore the antecedents of our contemporary size biases. The rest of the introduction informs the reader of her arguments, 
and how she conducted her analysis of her research sources. She then walks us through a series of what I call breadcrumbs, which are footnotes and endnotes and citations showing us that she has done her research and is not duplicating the work of other authors before she walks us through an overview of each chapter to come. This layout is very typical for historical pieces. In fact, this is how I had to lay out nearly every single one of my papers um, to walk my professor through what I was doing, how I conducted the research, and how I got to my conclusions. It's a way for historians to communicate with each other, to use their endnotes or footnotes. And so these are what I used when I was going in and looking at her research and looking at those quotes in context. So I have a few issues with the introduction, um, as you've seen and heard. Some have been described already, so I won't go into that anymore, but some haven't. So when she begins to describe what's upcoming in the book, she says in part two, she will explain that some devout Protestants viewed fatness as immoral. If only some Protestants felt this way, how did you come to the argument that the spread of Protestantism helped develop a fetish for thinness and a phobia for fatness. How did we go from some Protestants to the rise of Protestantism making that? So there's a wide gap to bridge there in reasoning, at least for me. She goes on to say in part three of the book, she will discuss how doctors viewed fatness and thinness through the late 19th and early 20th centuries, where she again says that doctors like Kellogg hoped women would gain weight to demonstrate the vigor of the nation. This is where she says the rise of actuarial tables identified excess weight as a risk, making doctors more concerned about women and people in general being overweight. She claims she will show the swing from one epidemic of two thin women to that of the obesity epidemic. But in this introduction, she has failed to do so in any meaningful way. So I'll hold my final conclusions until I read that chapter, but I'm a little wary based off what I've read so far. Strings hasn't yet, for me at least, made solid enough connections to the racism of fat phobia. Instead, spending this introduction trying to create a thinness epidemic that happened prior to the obesity epidemic with sources that are only advocating for more straight-sized body types. Her failure to describe the historic fatness she refers to as a straight-sized body has provided an entire group of modern fat liberation and fat acceptance activists a false ideology. Obesity is unhealthy and there are mounds of scientific studies to prove it. The learned men she uses to hold up her wobbly structure do indeed argue against thin bodies, but they are far from arguing for the body shapes and sizes of contemporary fat folks who have created a scale of fatness that include words like small fat, death fat, and InfiniFat. Strings needs to make clear that the fat round women from the 1800s were not the same as the fat round women fighting fat phobia today. I had a blast getting to be a history nerd and using my research skills to really dig into the introduction of this book. I had freaking sticky notes everywhere. So if you liked this format, if you're looking forward to more of the book, please leave a like or comment on this video. Your interactions really help me as I plan for future content um, that will come out on this channel. I'm really looking forward to hearing what you all think about what we talked about, about the introduction. Thank you so, so much for watching today. I will see you in the next one. Bye.